Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dad Vice TV, and this is Dad Vice TV Live. And this happens to be episode number 101. And since it is Tuesday, we have renal dietitian Jen Hernandez here with us. But we have something extra special today a special guest because it is Nephrology Nurse Week, and we're celebrating it. And we have a nephrologist nurse here with us but kind of getting ahead of myself if you are new welcome to dad vice tv and go ahead and say new in the comments hey we got a new one right here boom that way everyone can know that you're new and they can say hello and introduce themselves because we have a great community here that's very positive and very supportive now if you are new let me introduce myself real quick my name's james I am a kidney patient. I was diagnosed almost two years ago with stage five kidney failure. I spent a week in the ICU and it was not fun. And the nephrologist got my GFR all the way up and stable at 13 and said, hey, that's as good as it's gonna get. As a matter of fact, she said, you gotta go on dialysis and get a transplant. And if you don't, the time is, your clock's ticking. 45 days, it's not gonna be good. You could be dead. Well, I never went on dialysis. I never got a transplant. Instead, what I did is I used my super nerd powers and I researched and I bugged smart people all around the world to learn what I could do to change my life, to change my diet, to live kidney friendly. And my kidneys, my health, my labs started to improve. I got to stage four. I got into stage three. And most importantly, my symptoms all of them are gone. Anemia, gone, kicked it to the curb. And But all of this couldn't have happened without great people sharing information. And the most important person in my healthcare team that helped me was a renal dietitian. So let's say hello to our renal dietitian here on Dad Vice TV, Jen Hernandez. Hey Jen, how you doing? Hey guys, I am doing really wonderful, soaking up my last couple weeks here in Hawaii, but you all know that I'm getting ready to move and things are getting crazy. So I'm just going to enjoy it while I can, but I am so happy to spend this time with you guys checking in and especially celebrating our special guest today. Awesome. Now tell everybody about what a renal dietitian is in case they're new to this. So a renal dietitian is specifically a registered dietitian that focuses solely with people who have chronic kidney disease. So I myself am a registered dietitian and I've been a registered dietitian for oh a handful of years now, I think 2012, <laughs> 2013. Um, you guys know I don't keep track of time. So somewhere <laughs> around there. And then I eventually became a board certified renal dietitian and that was after I spent thousands, literally thousands of hours working with people in dialysis, working with people in outpatient, early stage CKD to learn everything there is to learn and still learning more about renal nutrition. So I am a renal dietitian. I only see people, I only work with people who have kidney disease and I help them make changes with their diet through good eating, nutrition and lifestyle changes so that they can keep their kidneys functioning, even see improvements and not have to go on dialysis. And I am so thrilled that I have been able to do this and see so many amazing results from my clients and from the people who are in the plant powered kidneys course, which I will definitely be keeping you all informed about in these next upcoming weeks. Yeah, and you have a Facebook group, Plant Powered Kidneys. If you do not belong mm -hmm. to that, you guys need to join it. I need to take a quick sip of water. I'm losing my voice for a second. I'll let you tell them about so the, your Facebook group. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. So the Plant Powered Kidneys Facebook group, there it is free to join. It is a private community on Facebook that you do need to answer the questions to prove to me that you're not a bot and that you're not a spammer. And we will make sure that you are part of this really wonderful group. Everybody is great about sharing plant-based recipes, supporting each other, providing really great questions and ideas, and it's all completely free. I also do have a free meal plan that you can download on my website. 
That is jenhernandezrd.com. You can get that free meal plan, tinker around, look in the blog with information, even about stuff that we've talked about in past shows. I'll have blog posts there for you to check out as well. Tons of resources and information for you on the website too. Awesome. All right. Got my sip of water and my voice is back. It has been a long day for me on the phone, chatting with people and having a great time spreading the word about kidney disease. Now, speaking of spreading the word, we have someone who is working on the front lines with kidney patients. Our special guest, would you like to go ahead and introduce her? Because she's one of your friends. Yeah, I am so excited. This is a good friend of mine who I have the utmost respect for. She is amazing. I told you guys, um, I worked in dialysis. I worked in dialysis in Texas, California, Hawaii. And this lovely friend of mine was my boss <laughs> and <laughs> a great nurse, great friend of mine in California in my dialysis clinic there. Her name is Julia. You call her Nurse Julia. And she is here today to represent the nurses for Nephrology Nurse Week. And I am so excited that she said yes to being on the show today with us. All right, let's all welcome Nurse Julia. Hey there, how you doing? Hey, Hi, how are you doing? Hey, we are doing so fantastic. I'm Julia, and it's a pleasure to be here and talk all about nephrology nurses and what we do for the patients and how we support families. And I like to joke around, we, we're the, the, the heart in the clinic that no one really notice it sometimes. <laughs> How is there? Well, the good news is you have a large audience here who notices and greatly appreciates not only the things that you do, but the time you're giving us today. That is absolutely fantastic. Matter of fact, you are the first nephro, nephro <laughs> it's, it's a tongue twister here. <laughs> the first nephrology nurse we've had on the show. <laughs> so why Thank don't you, you. Go, go ahead and tell us what the heck is a nephrology nurse for those that don't know so a nephrology nurse is a nurse who works under the nephrologist and we are the ones who um, review labs we follow orders for the nephrologist we provide the direct patient care to the, the patients in the hospital um, we welcome the patients when they first are being introduced to dialysis post-hospitalization. Um, I'm the type of person, or nurse rather, that when I have a patient, I'm constantly observing my patient from the moment they walk in the door so I can see any small nuances from their prior treatments. Um, if we do see something different with a patient, we immediately contact the nephrologist to work with them to get something changed, get a lab drawn just to make sure that we are constantly taking care of that patient and providing the best care that we possibly can. Awesome. Um, so what did it take to become a nephrology nurse? So that everyone kind of can get an idea of your background and you're not done. You're still going to school to do even more. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So originally um, for me, my pathway started as a PCT while I was finishing nursing school. Um, once you go to nursing school, you can go into any, any area you want to. Um, I focused on nephrology since I was familiar with it already as a PCT. Um, there's really no specific training in the, in school for nephrology nursing. You kind of just become more specialized the longer you're in it. Um, I'm also an active member of the American Nurses Associ Nephrology Nurses Association. So I'm constantly keeping up to date on all those wonderful updates and changes, and um, I'm always challenging myself to learn more. I'm on the pathway to my MSN so I can become a nurse practitioner, so I can even work more directly with a nephrologist to provide adequate care. Um, but that's it. I mean, it's just constant, like, working with nephrology nephrologists and, like, really kind of building rapport with them so they can teach you and groom you even more of, of what they know, and that's what I've had the pleasure to do these last almost 10 years now. Yeah, that is great. So, what got you to think of nephrology, to, to choose that as kind of your specialty? Well, my grandmother actually was in dialysis for the last couple of years of her life. So I had some, you know, situations where I didn't really appreciate the way things were handled. And I wanted to be the person to change that. So 
I want families to know that they don't have to be afraid. They don't have to be scared that we're here to support them and that, you know, we can give them, you know, a quality of life even while on dialysis. And those are things that weren't provided to my family and I while we were taking care of my grandmother. So I want to be that change. So in order to be the change, you got to put the put forth the work. So that's what I'm doing. That is awesome. Um, it, it really means a lot when you find someone who has a family experience because then there's, you know, there's going to be some compassion and they want to make change, to make things get better, to help people because they saw some things that probably most nephrologists and other people don't really see. So that is fantastic. Um, glad to hear you are here in nephrology because I think we need more great people in this field helping patients and kind of uh, guiding us through it because it's kind of scary online. Now, um, what, and I'm trying to think of great questions, so you can chime in if you want, Jen. <laughs> I have one. I have Go one. ahead. So, Nurse Julia, you know I know the answer to this, but you said that you were a PCT. What is a PCT? So your PCT is the patient care technician. So those are the pe- the individuals who are in the clinic who work underneath the, ner- underneath the nurse to provide the direct patient care to our wonderful patients. And what do the PCTs do when they're helping their dialysis patients? So those are the individuals who will come to the door, walk them in, get their weight, take their belongings, um, get them to get them to their chair, take their basic blood pressure, temperature, and then um, even cannulate their access or some in places, even their catheter, if it's allowed in the state that they're in, and then provide the treatment and the nurses there to oversee all of that. Mm-hmm. PCTs are also amazing people in the dialysis clinic who do a lot of work and are also very, very appreciated. So they're just another great part. And I think personally, uh, for Julia to have gone through starting at that PCT position and learning from essentially the ground up, being that direct person who you see right when you walk into the dialysis clinic. I mean, that was her to be right there to do all these things. She learned everything from the ground up. And after becoming the PCT, advancing to that nurse position and now going into nurse practitioner. And that is just phenomenal. And uh, that is such an exciting career path to take, especially when we're focusing on nephrology and kidney care. Yes, definitely. I'm trying to catch up on all the comments in here. People are loving this. <laughs> Uh, I want to I want to mention one thing real quick. A few people asked what the name of the Facebook group was. For those that are looking for it, it is Plant Powered Kidneys, and there is a link in the description. And if you're watching this on YouTube, the very first comment that's pinned has a link to that Facebook group as well as all of Jen's past videos here on Dadvice TV. So you can go in there and binge them and get caught up with her stuff. All right. So what, here's some things. So I've, I've never had dialysis. I've been, I'm very thankful and lucky for that. But what do you think are the most common issues you see where the patients maybe didn't understand something or they weren't prepared for something? You know, what do they need to know that might make it better when they first start dialysis? Just be patient. There's a lot of changes. It's, it's scary. It's, you're going to be nervous. There's, Things that you don't know, noises, smells, it's all different. Um, It's very taxing on the body. It really, truly is. Um, But just come with an open mind and don't jump to say no too quick. Um, There's things that we can do. I mean, modalities, there's so many modality options right now. So you don't have to be in the clinic. I prefer to tell people that it's best to go home. Mm -hmm. and do peritoneal dialysis and stay home and stay safe and enjoy more of, you know, time with your family versus come in and see us in the clinics. Well, I'm not in the clinic anymore, but, um, but just, just be patient. It's going to take a while before you kind of understand everything that's going on. And like they say, it takes what seven touch points for an adult to learn something. So it's going to take a while. So, and when you're sick, it's going to take even longer. So just know we're here for you. Yep, very good. Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. I'm trying to catch up on the company. All just started coming real quick as you were wrapping that up. 
Boom. Okay. Uh, actually, while I'm catching up with this, Jen, can you can you ask some questions? <laughs> There's quite a few. I'm okay, gonna yeah, respond I was gonna to. Chime. I didn't want to cut you off, but I was going to chime in too. <laughs> so, Nurse Julia, um, when people come in, you know, I remember when we worked in the clinic, it, it was definitely overwhelming when people first walk in. There's a lot to learn. Who do you think is like the first go-to person that somebody can? really start to work with when they're getting into dialysis and when they're learning all of it. Like we have a team, we have a lot of people there that are supporting and helping people on dialysis. Who do you think from your perspective is like, this should be your go-to person who's going to answer and, and really support you and help calm you down during that time? You know, it's a dual effort. It's really the PCT nurse combination. I mean, those are the two people you're going to spend the most time with. And they're, they're the ones who are going to get to really know you and learn about your, your favorite things, your least favorite things. And, you know, they're there to hold your hand. Um, and then when we see issues, we are able to escalate those either to the dietitian or to the social worker or to the nephrologist. So those are your two front people are your PCT and nurse. And that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking about the nephrologist, how often should somebody expect to see their nephrologist when they're on dialysis? Like, do they go there? Do they have to go to the doctor's office? Like, how does that work? Well, most of your nephrologists in the outpatient setting will see you in the clinic once a week. Um, if you need to see them more often, then they have their own personal office hours, which you're more than welcome to call and try to schedule an additional appointment to. But ideally, it's just once a week, unless you're in another modality, which is like peritoneal dialysis, where you only see them twice a month. Mm -hmm. Or once a month, actually. Sorry about that one. But yeah, just about once a week. Is it, but if any time during the during your other um, treatments, if you have a question, we can always call a nephrologist or Cajun nephrologist. They're always readily available to answer a question or a concern. Awesome. So a couple questions here. So when you do go on dialysis, are you automatically placed on the transplant list, or is that something that I need to work with someone to make sure it happens? So when you start dialysis, it's, you're not automatically put on the transplant list. That's something you need to work on. You have to see the social worker. You have to be added to an, um, a transplant uh, program at one of the local hospitals. And then there's a lot of work up in order to get active on the transplant list. Usually you can be inactive on the transplant list until you meet your um, requirements. But they do count the date that you start your dialysis, which is your first date of dialysis ever as your benchmark. So they'll count back as that is your start date, but you're not active on the list until you go through the steps. So maybe then somebody who had dialysis when they're in the hospital and say you saw them and they just had a treatment or two there, but then after they left, they weren't continuing dialysis anymore. Does that time count as their first dialysis treatment? I don't believe so. It's, it's their first day of dialysis as a DKD or in-stage renal disease patient. They don't count for AKI. Okay, so in the uh, in the dialysis center for that specific kind of diagnosis. Yeah. Okay. So for me, I was diagnosed with in-stage renal failure. My original GFR was eight, and they got me up to thirteen. Um, I just compl I was like, I'm just gonna I'm gonna beat this thing. That was my my focus right now. Uh, I wasn't even thinking of getting on a transplant list. Um, do you know, would someone like me have been able to get on the transplant, even though I was able to get my, my health up and right now I'm holding pretty steady at a, at a healthy rate. My, my last GFR was 33 and I feel I'm probably still in the same range, even though I haven't gotten labs recently. You know, I wish I could tell you that answer, but that's actually outside of my scope. Yeah. Um, I would have to say that because there's a form we have to fill out, and you have to fill. It has to be sent by the signed from the by the nephrologist and everything. So un unless that form's filled, uh, I don't. I really don't know. Got it. Now, who trains or or educates the 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 new dialysis patient on what's going to happen? Is that something that they need to go home learn about themselves before dialysis starts? Or are there, are there like classes they can take through the dialysis center or the doctor or the nurse? How's that work? Well, I mean, ideally if something's happening in the hospital and the patient is of conscious and able to speak, 
that the nephrologist will explain what dialysis is, what's going to happen, what the expectations are. And as an inpatient dialysis nurse, I follow up and I'm constantly kind of touching points on that also. Um, but other than that, I mean, there are classes provided in the community for um, like kidney smart courses and you can lo like locate your local um, kidney center and they can probably direct you to what's happening in the community. There's also um, community Facebook comp or groups also, which are focused on that as well. Now, for those who are on dialysis, how important is diet? Um, I know fluids are extremely important, but is what I eat also just as important? Uh, for me, uh, yeah. diet's super, super important, especially when it comes to potassium and sodium, which are your two drivers for, you know, some of the labs that we monitor in the clinic. So yeah, diet is very, very important. That's why my right hand man is a dietitian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. The most important, at least for me, the most important part of, of my recovery has been working with the dietitian and doing what they recommend <laughs> and not trying to self-prescribe or find some other alternative solution. Um, how old can you be, or is there an age limit for getting on dialysis? There's no age limit. I mean, I've had people, like my grandma, for instance, my grandma was, was um, 86 years old when she started dialysis. Mm -hmm. So, and I've had patients up in their 90s starting. So it's just, wow. there's no age. Doesn't discriminate, unfortunately. Yeah, but it's great that that at least is there for those who are strong enough for it. Now, when, when you get, when you're, you're getting up there, you're more senior, do they try to get you to do home dialysis more so that you're doing less? more often or do they try to steer those more towards the the dialysis centers i mean it just depends on the patient and you know what type of environment they have how you know if they're able to catch on and learn the skills there's really no patient no modality wrong for any patient like what i want to say um if as long as the patient's willing to learn or they have a support system who's willing to do this to do the tasks that need to be done in order to provide the care, then anyone can do any treatment as long as they get tested for, like, if, is their perineum proper for it, appropriate for it, or, you know, those kind of things. Now, what could cause a doctor to refuse dialysis? That's a question one of the viewers asked. And I've actually seen some people say that they're not suitable for dialysis. Um. So to be considered not suitable for dialysis, I mean, they probably look at the prognosis of the patient. Like what's happening with this patient? Would the patient actually benefit from this or would this actually be causing more harm to the patient? And those are the only patients that would probably be considered not considered for dialysis. But we're at a point now where as long as we can do it, we're gonna do it. We have different modalities. like. Even in the hospital, we can do continuous renal replacement therapy, which is like the most gentle of dialysis we can do. And it's, you can have um, multiple you know, medications to help keep your blood pressure on while we're doing those treatments. But those, that's for the sick of the sick patients, but we can definitely do it. Now, have there been any new advances in dialysis recently? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> And, I mean, and, if we look back to the very first dialysis machine, like it's oh, I've seen a long pictures way. of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, the dialysis yeah. were huge back then. But no, I mean, from what I, I mean, in my last ten years, the the biggest push is just getting people to go home and do do PD at home and do a new do home hemo. Just stay home. Don't go in the clinics. Um, not that it's bad in the clinics. It's just that we want them to be able to spend more time in their home and you know have a better quality of life than having you go to a clinic three times a week, you know? Yeah. But it's very taxing on the body just to be transported to and from the clinic. Yeah, and my yeah, understanding- where it turns into like an all day event. If it's for a four or five hour treatment, but then you have your hour-ish commute there, your hour-ish commute afterwards. Um, if you have transportation, sometimes there's wait times that could be upwards of, you know, 30 minutes to an hour to wait for your transportation, it really does turn into a full day event uh, in those three days. And I'm guessing there's some kind of recovery time because I've seen a lot of people talk about 
they're just exhausted after dialysis. Now, if you do it, oh, good. Oh, I was just going to say, I found from, from my experience in dialysis that, uh, the people that I helped, the ones that struggled the most with their recovery time, it really had to do with their fluid balance. And I mean, you know, nurse Julia, I know you're really, really big on this too, about the fluid management side of things and taking care, making sure people don't drink too much water. So keeping a tight control on your fluid allowance, that is really, really helpful because if you, if your dialysis treatment requires a lot of fluid to get pulled and I'm saying like four kilos, which is about nine pounds, that is a lot for the body to go through. And that's where it becomes so much more of a workout for your body to go through all of that in that amount of time that you get four hours sounds like a lot, but it's really not. And you have this little tube and these needles and that's all that's taking out this fluid. It's really draining. So for people that are having a lot of uh, energy issues, I would definitely encourage to look back at your fluids, your fluid allowance, making sure that's really all in that right level. And you can talk with your nurse, with your dietitian about making sure that you're at where you're supposed to be with your fluids. Now, if I do dialysis at home, if I live alone, does that mean I can't do it? Do I have to have someone there to monitor or take care of things? You can do peritoneal dialysis at home alone. Mm. That'd be completely fine. I had a patient back home in Michigan. She did it all by herself and she was, she would drive to the clinic twice a month and everything was fine. It's just having the um, agility to be able to pick up the bags and, you know, set up the warmer and just knowing how to set the machine up, but she was completely fine. You can definitely do it. Very good. Now, a lot of people are commenting on here that they're too scared to be on dialysis. Um, how do you help people who are afraid? I, to be honest, I would be afraid to go on dialysis. Um, how do you help us get over that fear? You know, I would really recommend if, if you're a nephrologist, if you're followed by a nephrologist and they're seeing that your labs are trending towards the road to dialysis, let's call it, um, reach out to your local clinics and say, Hey, I have some questions. Can I come see the clinic? Can I come visit? You know, um, some clinics have, um, like ambassadors or whatnot that, that are there to help. They have some patients who are wanting to help other patients and just trying to get the communication out there and reach out to them and they can talk you through what their, what their exposure was, what their experience was and how that, you know, what they can help you with. I always tell my patients when they're new that, you know, hey, these are your neighbors. You all get to know them very well. You know, you know, become friends and, and just yeah. communicate. Very good. Now, are there any social workers typically available to help those that are, you know, there's a lot of emotional stress from going on dialysis? Yes, each clinic does have a social worker available. Awesome. Now, when I'm there at a clinic and I'm dialysis is being performed and and i'm actually speaking from no experience with dialysis at all um what do i typically do to pass time what's what's there to keep me entertained do i gotta bring my own how does that work well i mean there are televisions available for your use and we we do give like headphones out for the first treatment if you want some fancier ones like your airpods and then you you know recommend bring those on your own but um, you guys either talk to the uh, technicians, you can talk to your nurse, talk to your dietitian, um, watch television. I prefer having people sleep because sleeping makes you kind of lose touch with the time and it allows time to pass a little bit quicker. Um, so that's always my first route is just try to take a nap. I even remember having some people who would work. So they didn't want to give up their job but yep. they also had to come into the center to do dialysis and they would bring their laptop and they would set up their laptop and they would just crank out a good chunk of work during that time. I know James, you would, that totally would be do me. That if, if, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> but it's great because it is like four hours of depending on how you feel, it's, it's still four hours of, you know, you're, you're, you're not going anywhere. So be productive, make the most of it. You could read a book, you could do the, the watch TV, um, social media. I know a lot of people like to go on social media, watch dad vice during this yeah. time, you know, just saying. I, I do <laughs> know a, a lot. lot the majority of the views actually come on phones. 
So mm-hmm. they are sitting there. They're watching it. Great. And I stream whenever I'm in line. I'm at Walmart. You know, with COVID, I'm not out as much. But when I'm in line, I was streaming something watching it. So it's great to hear you can work. That would definitely be me catching up on emails or, or you know, documents, things like that. Now, I'm going to guess the answer of this. I just want to make sure and catch this question because it made me giggle. Um, I'm guessing the answer is no. Can you bring your guitar? Sure. <laughs> Wait, what? I would like. I have. A, I actually had a patient on holidays. He would actually bring his ukulele, and we would walk him around the clinic, and he would play and sing to oh, the other patients. That that sounds so fun. I, mean, I can, like that person. I mean. Yeah, make sure you make sure you're friends with your neighbors so that they're not complaining about your noise. So that's why you got to have a great attitude and be happy and cheerful. And nobody's excited to go to dialysis, yeah. but if you can be supportive and positive and uplifting, you know they're gonna want to have that guitar in the clinic. I tell you, every single time I do a show, I learn something, and I was certain the question, the answer to that question <laughs> was gonna be no. You can't. You're gonna disturb people. But I love the idea that you, you, it sounds like you're, I mean, it's almost a community. You're getting to know them like your neighbors and you want to be the friendly neighbor. And that maybe this is one way to bring a little bit of joy to something that typically isn't seen as, as you know, something you look forward to. Now, if, if I'm on dialysis and I'm going to a center, do I need a driver to drive me home or can some people drive themselves after treatment? Some people do drive themselves to and from dialysis, which is why we do a series of blood pressures. We do, you know, while you're sitting and while you're standing, and we assess that you you can leave safely on your own. I mean, at any time you don't feel safe, then you should definitely sit and wait until you feel more stable and capable of driving. At no way are we able to tell you that you cannot drive, but we can tell you if it's just not ideal timing for you, and that maybe you need to sit for a little bit until you're more stable. Awesome. Yeah. And people are loving this information here. And the person who asked about bringing their guitar is a retired musician. Awesome there. Yeah. I would love having a musician playing there for me. <laughs> yeah, we can, you can always set up a special date and be like, hey, so-and-so wants to bring their guitar on this day and play in the lobby. You can definitely do those kind of things. Awesome. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scroll through the questions. Jen, can you kind of... Well, what do you have next on your question list for? <laughs> um, so Julia, we, I know we didn't have it at our clinic, but uh, in Hawaii here, I did have it at the clinic. Um, do you know in your area or other resources for like support groups? Cause we're talking about how to help people feel more comfortable. You know, some people that have to go on dialysis and just there's no other option for them to avoid dialysis. Is there a group that you can think of or some resources that you feel would be really helpful for them to, again, kind of network with peers to learn more about it ahead of time? Because I've heard of support groups. I just don't know all of those resources. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know all the names of all those support groups. I know if you go on to your, your networking devices and what or platforms, rather, you can definitely look dialysis patients up and they'll, they'll be there. Mm-hmm. I've seen them. I just I don't know them personally. Yeah, I was trying to think because um, the clinic here in Hawaii that I last worked at, we had a support group that would meet in the dialysis clinic. And even Mm -hmm. though it was primarily a a, a handful of our dialysis patients, it was open to the community as well so that people Mm -hmm. who had CKD could come sit in and hear a little bit more, get familiar, meet some patients and and learn about... um, kind of just learn more about the whole process of dialysis and hear about it from somebody else's perspective. So, uh, yeah, definitely the, the networking online networking, we're talking like the social media stuff is really, really big that you can look that up. The American kidney fund. I want to say that they have a couple links and then the national kidney foundation I know does. Um, but each state, I know you can look that up and then see what kind of, uh, groups are meeting in probably not right now with, with everything, but, at least maybe a virtual option that could be something too. Yeah, probably on like Meetup. There's probably yeah. something out there. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, there's also a lot of dialysis support groups. Gloria was just mentioning that. I've seen a lot of those. And mm-hmm. the dialysis support Facebook groups that I've seen, they appear to be very positive and supportive, which 
can be tough on Facebook to find. So that's great to see those are out there. Um, here's a great question. Oh, now I got to scroll. We have so much stuff going on. Do you see patients getting off of dialysis once they've started? Or do you typically see them, they start dialysis, and the majority of them stay with it until they get a transplant or, or some other outcome? So I can speak on this. Um, so I've seen a few patients who came in as acute, in, uh, acute kidney injury patients who either was like a medication or a trauma situation. And within 60 days or so, they were able to go home. Um, I've uh, personally, I can share a personal story. Um, just recently, my uncle had developed um, something called NASH, which is, uh, <laughs> I can't even talk to him. Um, but anyways, it was, it's NASH, so his liver was failing him. It's not alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver, mm -hmm. which caused some hypertension in his um, portal vein, which backed up his kidneys and shut his kidneys down. So once we got the situation um, corrected on my uncle, and he only did dialysis for about one, one and a half months, he is now off dialysis once we got the the cause fixed. So it, it is possible. Yeah. Fantastic. Now I have a question, which is probably for you, Jen. Um, I've seen this on here a few times. So let me go and grab it. Um, flaxseed, chia and hemp seeds. What are your thoughts on those in the kidney diet? Oh my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you guys know in the Facebook community that I did the recipe for chia seed pudding, we did that yogurt bark that had the flax and the mm -hmm. chia seeds on there. Um, I think hemp seeds are great as well to put on. They have a little bit more of like, um, a, I want to say grassy, but that probably doesn't sound appealing, but it has like, it has a, earthy. Uh, yeah, earthy? Uh, not, <laughs> there, we there go. you go. I guess <laughs> let's run with that. Let's run with earthy. It has an earthy taste. Um, but I think hemp seeds are really great to be added. Um, the benefit about these seeds are that they have good, healthy fats to them. They have fiber. They have a little bit of protein. So I think across their across the board, they're an awesome thing to include in the diet. When it comes to the portion and how much, that gets to the individual of how much could or should you have to where it meets your own nutritional needs. But in general, um, yeah, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, very good. I, it kept coming up. I was like, I got to get that one in there. Another one that's coming up quite a bit, um, and, and you may have a, some good input on this one, um, Nurse Julia, is flu shots and kidney patients, especially this yeah. year with COVID and all that. <laughs> Julia and I feel very strong on this one. <laughs> You're better off getting it. It's It's something I recommend to everyone. I even recommend it to people who aren't even on dialysis. I recommend everybody getting a flu shot. It's not just to protect yourself. It's to protect everyone because if you, one person gets it, it can go crazy in a, in a community. So I always recommend getting it and protecting yourself by all means necessary. Yep. And I have mine scheduled for this Thursday. I'm taking my two kids. If anybody is in the local area, you will know when my daughter is getting hers. Um, the entire store knows it. We go to one of those small clinics. It's in a store. And just the thought of a needle, she goes crazy. <laughs> we have to hold her down. And this year, Aww. she wants, there's something she really wants, a piece of technology. And we said, okay, you got to do these things and get your flu shot and we'll get it for you. So we'll see if that oh, works this deal. year. Yeah. James, well, are you are you offering that deal to other people? Because I will <laughs> totally do that. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, she wants a phone. That's what she wants. Is an iPhone. Oh, oh dear. I got I got her a flip phone. <laughs> but hey, there's a phone. You can call your friends. But with today's kids, the flip ain't working. <laughs> oh no, not good enough. Let me see. Let me go back through here real quick. Someone um, had mentioned they buy pineapple rolled in, here it is, in chia seeds. Hey, Sean, that sounds really good. Yeah. I bet if you let it sit for a while, too, that the chia seeds would absorb some of that juice that comes off the pineapple. So it'd soften them. That sounds like a great snack idea. Yeah. Now, speaking of snacking. While you're on the machine at dialysis, can you eat? Can you snack? 
I prefer, oh, well, I always recommend you, if you're diabetic or it's like in between your meal times, by all means, bring a small snack. I don't want anyone bringing like a big three course meal, but definitely bring a small snack, something easy to digest because you don't want anything that takes too much energy to digest. So nothing really high in protein, you know, no steaks. <laughs> Julia, do you remember when one of our patients brought in a whole pizza to sit down and eat at during dialysis? Uh, yeah, I could not even imagine eating choices. half a pizza, let alone being on dialysis and bringing in a whole pizza. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. And I mean, it, it really does, it can affect your blood pressure when you're eating on dialysis. So it, it also depends on your clinic rules. Like some clinics will say flat out, no, you cannot eat during dialysis, and they will enforce that. Uh, some clinics will say it's okay, you know, and then some clinics will say um, only this or only that. Like there's different rules across. So check with your clinic manager also to make sure that you're following the rules because the last thing you want to do is get in trouble or, in my opinion, even worse, they take away your food. Oh, Natalie just posted people would bring in their McDonald's bags while I was at treatment. Oh, Natalie, my I had. I I was a busy dietitian, let me tell you. <laughs> well, I know from my experience when someone did bring in the McDonald's or the Burger King, I announced it to kind of shame them a little bit. I know it's not nice to say that, but I did it from a loving place. I mean, yeah. it's not that I wanted to hurt their feelings, but I needed to bring acknowledgement that this is not what you should be eating mm -hmm. while you're here. Exactly. Well, like Natalie said. I mean, Natalie saw it. Yeah, she another person. Coca Cola and Mountain Dew. Yeah. Yeah, Natalie. I mean, everybody's watching. Everybody sees what you're doing, and they know. Everybody knows some of the, at least those guidelines of things that you shouldn't be eating, regardless, but especially during treatment. So, um, people know. So even when even when a nurse or uh, somebody calls them out on it, it, everybody's saying what they're thinking too. Yep. Yeah. All right. They're Here is. Here is a fantastic question. I'm going to break it into two questions. Um, of course, I knew Ray would mention my ribeyes. I love ribeyes. Mm -mm -mm, that's my that's my weak spot, but I haven't had one in like two months now. But I am starting to get a craving again. But here's the question. What about traveling? Let's say I am on dialysis. How do I travel or go on vacation and stay within the country? We'll do that first, and then we'll talk about international. So it's really easy. If you if you have somewhere you want to go, you got to tell your your unit secretary or your administrative assistant, like, hey, this is where I'm going to go. You, you just need an address of where you're staying and the dates that you're staying there. And our team or the teams of the clinics, rather, I'm not there anymore. Um, they will work with the um, clinics where you're going to arrange a date and a time for you to have dialysis there in their clinics as a visitor within the United States. Awesome. Now, what about if I'm going overseas? I'm going to Canada or someplace. Well, we will also communicate with them. However, there may be out-of-pocket char charges since your insurance probably won't cover that there. I know, like, for people who live in Mexico, like, they can come over here to California and or vice versa, and they have to pay out of their pocket. So I would imagine it'd be the same, you know, more broadly, too. Ooh. Oh. But we'll say... That's another benefit of doing something like peritoneal dialysis, where you have your own machine, you have your own supplies, you get a uh, basically a permission slip, you get a medical note from your doctor that says you are allowed to take these onto a plane or wherever you're going, or you can have, yeah, you can have them shipped. So mm -hmm. doing, it's another, it's another vote in the home treatment category because it makes it so much easier. You just take your stuff with you. And I mean, I remember one of my, one of my patients, I, I worked with a lot of people on PD when I was in Texas, and uh, one of my patients was a traveling salesman. So oh, he wow. basically, yeah, so he basically had his stuff in the trunk of his car, and he would always be getting the notes from us so he can go on the flights and, and do all that. But he worked and traveled and did dialysis basically as he continued to work. And then I saw I saw that comment about the dialysis cruises. cruises. Yeah. They do have those. They're just out of pocket. So <laughs> oh. I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I've not heard anything about them being 
uh, covered in any way. But but it is a, something if you saved up for, if you yeah. wanted to do a, a trip that would be safe with dialysis, that could be an option. Awesome. Now, if I'm going into, so I'm, not, I'm, not, blah, I'm now catching up on a lot of the questions that are in here. Um, so they're going to kind of bounce around a little bit. If I'm going into the center to get dialysis, should I eat a, a, a normal meal before I go? Or should I wait till after I get dialysis to eat my, my regular meal and just snack while I'm there? Um, well, Nurse Julia, you want to go for that one? I mean, it's a dual, it's dual effort here, a dietitian nurse. Um, basically, the patient's diabetic. You want to make sure that they're monitoring their blood sugar and eating adequately to support that. Um, if it's just, you know, a normal, normal day, non-diabetic patient, then you don't want to eat too much. I mean, every person tolerates dialysis differently. So learning how you tolerate it is going to be a learning curve. So I, re I don't recommend eating a huge, you know, pancakes, waffles, eggs, bacon, sausage, biscuits kind of breakfast, but just eat something smaller and lighter for until you understand how your body's going to tolerate it. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think I think start kind of small and then pack a light snack with you so that you have a little bit of something in case you're not feeling really good. Um, and then after dialysis, see how you feel because afterwards you're you're probably going to be hungry. I mean, these dialysis treatments in the center are four or five hours long. So you will be hungry, especially you'll be really hungry after that time. You might be really tired. So that's when it's a good idea to have an easy meal or if you have a family or a, a family member or a friend who could have a meal ready for you or something you have like leftovers, anything like that, because you're going to want to come home and just like nuke it and eat it. Yeah. And chill. Yes. <laughs> now, Beverly said, I hear a lot of people get sick while on dialysis. And I've actually heard the same thing, too, that a lot of people, they feel really bad while they're on the machine. Hmm. Well, I mean, I, honestly, it's, to my experience, it's not a lot of people. I mean, there, there's maybe once here and there. I mean, ideally, I have, I would have shifts with no sick people on it, but it's, it's usually the people who are non-compliant who will get those symptoms a little bit more often, or the people who are newer to dialysis in general because their body is just still trying to get used to the process and having things removed and added, and it's just a big process, but. Um, it's not, ideally, it's not that many people that truly get sick on dialysis. Oh, that's and, great And I would hear. add too. Yeah, I would add too that, I mean, from my experience in dialysis as well, when I would walk through the clinic, it's not like everybody's getting sick. My guess, knowing social media, knowing Facebook groups, knowing the things that people might be posting, there might be more people commenting about how they get sick. But what you need to ask them in those groups or whoever's saying this well, did you tell your nurse? Did you tell your PCT? Did you tell your doctor? Because some people, if they don't say anything, then obviously Julia, your doctor, myself, like we're not going to know that you're not feeling good. You have to say something. And that's something that I always, always push when I was meeting somebody new is to speak out and say, anytime you don't feel good, you really want to be vocal about that because that's going to give us better information to understand how your body's doing with dialysis and they can make changes so that you feel better. So if you're not feeling good on dialysis, please say something, tell your nurse or your technician and they will look to do everything they can to help you feel better, but you've got to say something. Yeah. And that is so important. Speak up. When I was first having kidney issues, I had a lot of the symptoms and I just thought, yeah, I'm getting older. I'm not going to mention that to my doctor. Some of them were pretty bad. It's like, yeah, that's kind of embarrassing. I'm not going to mention that to my doctor. I wish I would have so that they have the full picture. So if something doesn't feel right, if you're not feeling well, if you've got a symptom that's new, speak up. Let your doctors know. All right, we have another great question here. And I know this happens because it's life. What happens if you miss a dialysis appointment? How many days can you go without it? Ideally, we say never miss a treatment. Um, they say I, um, the, the ongoing story right now is if you miss a dialysis treatment, you're actually increasing your mortality rate by almost 30% for each treatment you miss. Oh. So, yeah, and it depends on each person how many days they can miss treatment because of how their 
their residual kidney function, whatever their kidney is able to do still for them. But there's no set number. I can't tell you that. Just and like we have a patient withdrawal from dialysis, we can't tell families how long their loved one's going to live without dialysis. Just we don't have that. And and also when it comes to, to missing treatment, I mean, if you think about what dialysis is supposed to be doing is it's supposed to be replacing what your kidneys can no longer do. And they're cramming all of that. Your kidneys work 24 hours a day, 365, never take a holiday, always working. So we're trying to do as much as possible in that four hours of dialysis treatment that's supposed to cover one, two, three days, let's say, if you're going like across a weekend. And to miss one of those treatments, to miss one of those four hour times, you're going to go that much longer where the toxins are going to build up in your system. Blood pressure gets funky, probably feel nauseous and just not that great. Or you might not feel anything, but <laughs> it doesn't mean that everything's okay because right. your body is trying to adapt and, and, and basically say it's okay, but it, it's never a good idea to miss a dialysis treatment because it's just going to come back and you're going to feel worse the next time you go to dialysis too. Yeah. Now what about germs and getting sick is one form of dialysis home versus in center more sensitive to germs and getting sick? I mean, both have germs. I mean, it, and you can't control the microscopic germs, um, but it's just making sure that people are doing their hand washing. Proper hand hygiene is always number one. Um, keeping household services clean, keeping the clinic services clean. Um, I mean, there's going to be less risk in the home because the only people in there are going to be you and your loved ones versus having, you know, 70 to 100 different patients coming through a clinic. Um, so, and that's the only thing I can actually speak on. And, and what about our, those of us that have four legged friends that are family members? What are the, the restrictions there at home? Well, you can have, you can have your puppies cause I am a proud puppy or puppy owner. Myself. <laughs> but if you're doing peritoneal dialysis, all you'd have to do is just make sure your animal's not in the room while you're doing the connection and disconnection on your, um, PD catheter. That's the only stipulation. They can be in your home. Awesome. I did not know that. And someone else had asked a question about that. Now, if I'm on dialysis, do I have to eat a unique dialysis diet or is it pretty much a renal diet or is it just a normal, and we were talking about McDonald's and pizza, or is it just a try to eat healthy, but eat what you want? I'm going to take this one. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> so, there is some general guidelines when it comes to the renal diet on dialysis. It's totally different, you guys, from what we've talked about in past episodes about the renal diet, since you know that I focus on people that aren't on dialysis. Very, very different diet. So the diet for dialysis is, well, in some senses, it's very different. In some senses, it's not. It still goes back to the individual, and it's still that concept of eat to your labs. So you, in dialysis, you'll get at least one lab report once a month, and you'll have that reviewed with your dietitian in the dialysis clinic. You might get more depending on your, circum your, your circumstances, your situation, but you want to use those labs as your guide of what's going on and how good you're feeling and how well you're eating and how your appetite is. So use the lab to serve as your guide. When you first get to the dialysis clinic, you will see your dietitian within the first couple weeks and they will give you some guidelines of what to focus on, what to eat, what to avoid or watch out for. And that's really the time that you want to come with your questions. So you can always, because the dietitian's in the dialysis center, you can always request to speak with them at any point in time. I mean, granted, I will say we are quite busy and we have a lot of people to see and a lot of people to care for. And in some cases, some dietitians will work at different dialysis clinics. So we might not be at that clinic at that time. But if we will always, always prioritize the people that want to speak with us. So make sure that you request to speak with the dietitian, your team, just talk to the PCT, talk to the nurse, and they will relay that message to your dietitian so that you can speak and ask your questions and get a better idea of what you should be focusing on. Some of the things like Nurse Julia was saying with uh, sodium, potassium, if your levels are looking funky or you're not feeling good, that would be a great thing to talk to the dietitian about. So you, for one, they want to learn what you are eating. So then 
they can talk about what kind of changes would be helpful for you. So, and then the other thing, just to kind of add on to that, don't lie to your dietitian. They know, they see your numbers, they see what you bring to clinic. Don't lie to us. I know about my perfect food journal. Oh, I know, yeah. I swear, when people would tell me, oh no, I never eat anything, and then their potassium is sky high, like that, that, that doesn't, no. That doesn't work for me. I'm sorry. Or My doctor knows if I'm trying to fib. He'll be like, yes, did exactly. you eat right? Just how nervous I am getting on the scale. He knows if I was eating right or not. <laughs> if I yeah, run so in there and I'm like, hey, let's go to the scale. I want to show you a number. He knows I stuck to my diet. <laughs> <laughs> now, Robert asked an interesting question. What about if you're on dialysis? You have to go to the restroom. Is that? Well, there's a process, I'm guessing. There's a process. So you just let your nurse or your patient care technician know, be like, hey, I need to go to the bathroom and we will uh, pause your treatment, return your blood to you. We put the machine in something called recirculate. So we just kind of keep the machine moving while you're away and let you go to the bathroom. Wow. I that, I'll tell you, I got kind of a, a tinge hearing that recirculate, return your blood back to you. But yeah, there is, I guess there's quite a bit of it in the machine. They put it back into you. Um, now, are there any symptoms that are normal while you're on dialysis, such as feeling dizzy, cramping, or anything like that? Well, feeling dizzy is not normal. Um, but, you know, you may feel some slight cramping here and there just from the shifting of the fluids and such. Um, also, that's a good indicator if you're having too much sodium in your diet because you'll feel some cramping because of the fluid's trying to be pulled from the extra, from the um, from your tissues instead of your blood's, um, blood that's circulating. But you, you temp- typically, you should just maybe feel a little fatigued, but nothing, no real crazy things should be happening. If they are happening, that's when you need to become your advocate and holler and scream and let the people around you know that something's not quite right so we can intervene before something happens. Nothing like really bad happening, but just right. before your blood pressure goes down and you really feel crummy. Yep, here is a great question. I'm surprised I did not think of it. Jane and Bill asked, how do they determine your GFR while you're on dialysis? Cause you've got a machine that's kind of filtering and taking place of what your kidneys do. How do we know what it is now? Hmm. There's a lab that, that they draw. They draw, you know, they draw your your lab at the beginning and your lab at the end. And they do some calculations and then they, they come up with that number for you. Got and it. And I'll say too that um, I actually had this conversation with a client the other day. Um, the GFR is not typically measured once you're on dialysis because once you're on dialysis, your mm-hmm. official diagnosis in most cases uh, Nurse Julia talked about the acute kidney injury, but most cases, your official diagnosis is end stage kidney failure. So kidney failure, end stage, as in it is way, way, way too low. And that is the point where they don't typically check GFR. Now, it could be something you could also go to your nephrologist's office or request additional labs to get it checked. Or you can use, um, let's say, the National Kidney Foundation's the GFR calculator. And mm-hmm. they would be able to, you could type in your, some of your lab results there to get that estimation. Um, but the GFR is not something that you will find on your month to month lab draw report. Got it. Now, in, if there's an emergency and the dialysis center has to close, typically what happens? Cause then you're missing your in-center treatments. So in the event of an emergency, we have a phone number for everyone to call and see where they can go to the next closest clinic for their dialysis. And that's really all there truly is. Other than that, you can go to your local emergency room. Um, But that's, that's how it's handled right now. Cool. And then we have another great question here. So dialysis, at least in center, here's an example where he's going Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but that gap between Friday and Monday is kind of big because you got the weekend there. Um, I'm guessing that's normal. Do, 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 Do patients have to do something different on the weekend because of that extended time, not to get too much fluid or too much sodium or anything like that? Yeah, you just have to be more mindful of what you're eating, what you're drinking, and just try to put that into to your uh, 
plans for the weekend. Awesome. Oh, and I want, I just noticed something. I'm catching up on the messages. Natalie, who has been great at answering so many dialysis questions in the group, Today is her birthday. Happy birthday, Natalie. Happy birthday. Oh, happy birthday, Natalie. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of you were saying happy birthday, and I saw it in another window, and I'm like, whose birthday is it? I got to figure this out. <laughs> but she <laughs> she has been fantastic at answering a lot of the questions. The one about the bathroom, um, I saw she answered it and talked about a home dialysis. Comes with a 20-foot cord. <laughs> if yes. She need to. <laughs> Good job, Natalie. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and, and she says, hey, because of dialysis, that's why she's here to have another birthday. All right, I'm scrolling through this. Lots of happy birthdays in there. That gives everyone an idea where I am in the comments. There's so many of them. <laughs> Let's see, what all do we have here? So uh, battery backups. A few people asked about that power outages. I'm assuming the clinics all have generators and stuff to take care of themselves. What do people at home do? Do the machines come with a battery backup or do I have to figure out a solution to keep the machine, the home machine running? No, the machines don't come with a backup battery. So if your home is equipped with a generator, that would be best. Otherwise you'll have to find somewhere where there is electrical access, electricity. Ah, interesting. So here at home, we have battery backups everywhere. I want to get a generator installed just because I hate, I, I love the idea of the power going out and my light still being on. <laughs> <laughs> back in California, back a long time ago, I bought a house and it had a generator. I don't know why. Uh, and there was a big power outage and there was something on TV. It might have been the Academy Awards or something. Something big was on. And I. I ended up just opening my windows, having the TV on so people could come and watch it in the yard during the power outage. Kind of became a, 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 a neighborhood event. <laughs> now, Natalie does have a question about nutrition. Um, are there any recommendations for how to increase calcium without raising phosphorus? Yeah, there, um, honestly, I think a great option would be some greens. So that I think would be really fantastic to include some greens, broccoli, collard greens, tofu yeah. is another source of calcium that you can include. Uh, even some greens will have it. Worst case scenario, there might be some supplements that you could take and that would be prescribed by your doctor, oftentimes recommended by your dietitian. Definitely don't take supplements unless they're cleared because there is oftentimes a concern of high calcium levels with dialysis. So don't take don't take those kind of supplements unless it's already approved and uh, by your doctor and dietitian um, to help with those calcium levels. But there's, I, I don't want to go into too much of the, mm -hmm. the, I mean, there's a lot more behind the calcium, especially low calcium levels. Um, my, my biggest concern I would say, or the thing that I want everybody to think of is low calcium levels. The symptom of low calcium levels that you should look for is when your mouth is numb or tingling tingling. Okay. That, that is the symptom of low calcium levels. So if you notice that your calcium levels might be low, let your doctor know, let your healthcare provider know to make sure that you get it confirmed. But that is one of the telltale signs of low calcium. If you're not experiencing, if you're not experiencing that symptom, your calcium might not be as low as it seems. So again, I'm not going to go too much into the whole background with that, but I like to go by the symptoms, not just the numbers. Mm -hmm. And we are now at the top of the hour. So I want to squeeze one more question in here because I think this is an important one. Is it important to have your electrolytes balanced when you're on dialysis? There you go, dietitian. <laughs> yeah. So that's been a big part of, I think, a lot of the talk we've had today about your sodium balance for your fluids, about the potassium balance for your nutrition and also for your dialysis, because that's going to be a big part of removing um, some of the things that you have in your body. So it, it's not a, it's not a test of how far can I get out of range to see what the dialysis will do for me. It's more of what can I do to keep it better so that my dialysis doesn't have to be harder. 
So it's really, really important, but you will get those lab results and you'll be talking with your dietitian in dialysis about what those mean and what you can do to adjust them. And it's related to your diet, it's related to your fluids, it's related to your dialysis treatment, your medications, and that's why there's a whole team in dialysis that is there to support you because everybody can provide an idea, suggestion, or some insight into what makes the most sense for you and for your labs. All right, I lied. I'm going to ask one more question because I have a question that can address a lot of these questions. They're, they're related. It's about fluid. So a lot of people are saying, hey, yeah, I get a dry mouth. I get the dry lips. It's from medication or just the limited amount of fluids that they're allowed to drink while they're on dialysis. What are some tips to help them address that fluid restriction and still feel like they're getting enough? Who wants to uh, well, take it? <laughs> I'll say first of all, James, you and I did a talk about this, about tips for controlling summer fluids, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And all I'll say is right now, I want you to take a second and imagine biting a lemon. Okay, just imagine biting into a nice juicy lemon wedge. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's it. Julia. I mean, it did it for me. Like My mouth was, was watering. <laughs> <laughs> we always recommend hard candies and, and lozenges and ice chips because you know less volume in ice chips yep awesome well i want to thank you very much for your time um, we took a little bit over an hour here lots of great questions lots of great information i hope you enjoyed it people are saying thank you let me post a few of these up there so you can see it um we weren't able to get to everyone's questions. Some questions were a little too specific, just in case you're wondering, hey, why didn't they answer my question? We can't provide individualized nutrition or treatment recommendations. The best source for that is your doctor. They have all your labs. They know your health and what's going on. But I want to thank everyone for being here, being um, engaged in all these great comments. I saw that Steve from Urban urban health oh steve type your type your thing here i've got it i'm confused by it um urban health outreach media that's it is doing a show in about an hour from now uh, guys check him out he's over there on facebook he's over on youtube they do great shows and i love to help get more people over there watching it for our guest here thank you so much for joining us and for everyone that's watching thank if you, you haven't subscribed yay click that subscribe button and uh, we will see you in the next video.